My name is Gassia Mikaelian, and I'm coming to you through KTVU Fox 2 News, serving the San Francisco Bay Area. Today, we're talking about something very important, and that is your eye health. Many of you may not have been able to get to the eye doctor during the beginning stages of the pandemic, but now, for the most part, that's changed. So let's talk more about eye health by welcoming Dr. Millicent Knight, Senior Vice President of Customer Development for Essilor, to this conversation. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Knight. Thank you so much for the invitation. Now, many eye, uh, eye doctor offices were closed at the beginning of the pandemic, and that's starting to loosen up. Let's just talk about, you know, that annual checkup that most of us should be getting. I imagine many people put it off. You know, it's funny. The eyes are the area of the body that if you ask if there was a sense that no one would want to lose, it would be the eyes. But yet, we tend to take them for granted, and that's unfortunate. But one of the things that we definitely don't want to do is put out that comprehensive annual eye examination. And to your point, during the COVID time period, there was a series of a period of adjustment, but almost every practice is back open, running with new protocols that are CDC mandated. And um, I think that everyone would be very safe going back to see their eye care professional. And I certainly would encourage you to do that. Even just before I had the chance to talk with you today, I did end up going back to my eye doctor for the first time in about a year and a half. We had appointments in April. We ended mm -hmm. up canceling because the office was closed. And my office was great. Dr. Yee in Dublin, California, here's a shout out. She <laughs> said, you know, one customer, one client allowed inside the office at all times. You have to wear a mask. You have to hand sanitize. Everything I touched was, you know, put in a corner of the office. She said, we don't use that pen again. We don't use that tray again. And I was the only one. I felt safe and I felt good that I was taking care of, you know, taking care of these because if these don't work, really the rest of it is very hard to do. Absolutely. And most of the doctors reached out to their, uh, to their patients and kept in touch with them throughout this whole epidemic period and made sure that they sort of took them along on their journey, if you will, to make sure that they understood once you're able to come back, this is what you're going to expect to see. And it's funny how somehow our parking lots have turned into waiting rooms now. Right. Where, you know, you're, you call and you come in and to your point, you're there really with um, either a very small number of people or, uh, you know, one family at a time. And that's to ensure your safety and also the safety and well-being of the doctor and their staff. Now, like so many things when it comes to our health, we usually might not pay attention to it until it starts to fail, right? When it comes to our eyes, I'm using my eyes differently these days. I've been working from home for the past five plus months. I used to wear contacts every day to try to read a teleprompter in the new studio. I've actually enjoyed this break during work from home because I'm not wearing contacts. And my eye doctor said that my eyes were actually healthier than when she saw me a year and a half ago. So could there be a little bit of an improvement because we're not in our typical school and office settings? You know, that's, it's quite possible. And you know, the interesting thing is the American Optometric Association says that there are over 265 diseases that can be de detected through the eyes. So it's not only important to check for early intervention around eye diseases, but also systemic diseases are often detected and can be managed much earlier. And to your earlier point, you can get into see the right uh, practitioner uh, for that particular condition early enough that it's not catastrophic for you and is not a drain on our healthcare system, which is already, as you know, well under challenge. Right. It's, it's almost, you know, when my husband tries to talk me into going for an oil change every three months, I say, oh, but the car is running fine. He goes, honey, it's either 60 bucks now or 400 at the end of the year. So I totally exactly. get it. Exactly. <laughs> um, let's talk about specifically how working from home and distance learning might be affecting the eyesight of Americans. I have two little boys. They're in fifth and sixth grades. They're supposed to be doing school right now at the kitchen table. And they are spending so much time on their laptops because that's how they interact with their teachers, with their classmates, and all their schooling is done online. And sometimes I see them squint and I get very nervous. So how is all that online learning affecting children's eyes? Yeah, well, I'm in solidarity with you because I have a sixth grader and he is now e-schooling, um, you know, six hours a day. And then he likes to do his gaming, you know, right. or not. I have this relationship now. Uh, <laughs> And so it's, it's not just the, and, and then in between that, you've got the telephone that they're reaching for and um, the working distance now that children, traditionally when we were just reading, we were using about 16 inches, which is still a stray away from the natural position of the eyes at infinity, which is where they're more relaxed and comfortable. 
But instead of 16 inches, which is already close enough for the focusing system, we're now seeing children on their digital devices holding them at 10 and 12 inches from the nose, which is really putting an amazing strain on the convergence and the accommodative system, the, the eye's ability to stay turned in at that distance for a long period of time. And not only is that um, causing some visual strain and some visual issues, but in addition, things like headaches, neck ache, back pain, all types of things that wouldn't seem to be directly tied to the eyes, but are. So my little, my sixth grader has, I think, a five or a 10 minute break in between his Zoom classes. And my husband forces him to get up, take your eyes off the laptop. He says, run around the house a couple times, go on the back patio, do a quick scooter lap or two, just anything physical and anything just to give your eyes sort of a different thing to look at. Because to my son, he'll, he'll take that 10 minute break and jump on YouTube and watch some BMX videos. And I'm like, that's not the point of a break. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And one of the things that we do, you know, we have a trampoline outside to your point. And I ask him to go outside, jump on the trampoline, get some energy out. But the other thing that I'm looking for him to do is to get some vitamin D. You know, the kids need to get out. They need to get that, the nutrients from the sun. Um, and then they just need to relax their eyes at infinity for a period of time. So one of the exercises that we have is every you know, 20 minutes, um, to look away from the computer or the digital device for 20 seconds uh, and look at 20 feet or beyond. So just kind of a 20-20-20 rule on that. Um, and, and, and then the other thing is, you know, it's, it's really important if we can take some of the activities that they do in the gaming space and simulate them outside. That's also another opportunity to get the children outside and to get them um, engaged with family so that you've got family time taken care of and you also have the children enjoying different types of activities. And if I could read um, some takeaways from our Global Myopia Awareness Coalition, um, GMAC as we call it short, um, it's a group of 15 companies that have gotten together to really in, in, increase awareness around comprehensive eye care and myopia in particular. And some of the data that we've collected over, with over 2,000 interviews with parents is that 44% of parents are saying their kids are spending four or more hours a day on electronic devices, which is really an increase of about 23% pre-COVID-19 time period. So it was already difficult and challenging enough but once that happened, it just really took it through the roof. And 67% of parents say that their children are spending more time accessing e-learning tools. Now we know that that stat has changed even and even increased because now a lot of the schools that were um, set to open up to face-to-face -face learning didn't end up doing that. So that number is even higher. But the thing that really got me was 61% of parents say that their children are, in addition to the e-schooling, they're spending 20% of those kids are on uh, gaming devices for four additional hours. And some of those parents are also engaged in the same activity. So number one, we have to kind of try and lead by example and exercise some discipline. Right. And, you know, it's hard to do because we want to try and get in, uh, as my husband says, am I working from home or am I living at work? Right. We're on our devices every chance we get to try and catch up on some of the emails that are accumulating, um, but we also have to lead by example. And one of the things that's really helpful for children is to exercise a curfew, if you will, around digital devices and use some um, ocular hygiene, digital hygiene, and shutting down digital devices about an hour before bedtime. And what we found that that does is that it allows the natural hormone melatonin to be able to kick in, shut the system down, and prepare the mind, the body to rest and get a peaceful sleep so that the children wake up alert and ready to go in the morning. And that's such a critical piece because if we don't do that, it delays the onset of that hormone and really causes for, a, sets us up for a very disruptive day the next day. I know sometimes on the weekends we push it in this house and we think, oh, it's a Saturday night. Let's stay up late and let's, you know, let's watch Star Wars, right? And, you know, the movie ends at 10, 15. The boys are finally in bed at, let's say, 10, 30. But their minds are racing, right? Yes. Because they just see, like, the yes. best movie in the world. And now their little minds are racing and they're like, I can't sleep. And I'm like, but I'm exhausted. So 
it, you know, <laughs> if, if we were smart parents, I think we'd, we'd break it up over two nights or really stick to that one hour before bedtime, really no, no screens, nothing that will, you know, get you all riled up because it is very hard to sleep even for grownups that way. I know, absolutely. But we're all learning as we're, as we're going along, you know, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's challenging. But one of the things that we can do is, again, to just try and be conscious and make sure that our children are conscious. And I love that, although we as an organization struggled with um, using gaming as a device to get our message out around eye care and myopia, we use that vehicle because that's where the children are. And you have to kind of meet people where they are. So what we've been able to do is use some of the uh, YouTubers and some of the gamers who have about 86 million followers you know, behind them and have them tell the story. Tell the story about why, yes, I love gaming, but I do take breaks. I do get up and I do move and I do walk away and I do make sure that I get my eye examination. And do you know what myopia is? And do you know what your refractive status is? And you know, asking those kind of questions questions in between playing some really cool games. Right. We found that to be very effective. I like it. I mean, and honestly, I'll tell you, I felt as if I had accomplished something when I walked out of my eye appointment. And, and that feeling is kind of rare to come by because I feel like we're all sort of stuck in this, you know, work from home, school at home, you know, really, I mean, here in the Bay Area in California, we're still pretty tight. And the only outing I have is the grocery store once a week. And so for me, I was mm -hmm. looking forward to seeing my eye doctor and we caught up, you know, about how's it been for you? How's it been for you? So it was actually probably the highlight of the week. <laughs> well, I'm sure it was a highlight for your eye doctor too, because we're very social people and used to interacting with patients and really like to follow their life story, if you will. Um, it's, it's, it's a profession that allows you to take a real comprehensive look at, at patients, not just their eyes as a separate entity, but their eyes as part of their body and a part of their lifestyle. So, um, yeah. I, it was so nice to, 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 to see her and now to be able to visit with you. Let me ask you, Dr. Knight, if, you know, she, she echoed a lot of what you're saying and that they're seeing, she is seeing problems come up for eyesight in young children, largely due to, um, you know, the excess use of screens. Is this something, in your opinion, that will, let's say, stick with our sixth graders? Are they going to, so I'm 45 years old, you know, is, is my sixth grader going to have worse vision than he would at 45 if he hadn't been on screen so much as a youngster? Or at some point, you know, is his vision at 45 just going to be what it was anyway, regardless of what he's doing now? You know, I think that's something that we're still learning. But what we do know is that it's really important for, um, for it to get that baseline examination so that we can track in tighter intervals any changes that occur with the visual system. Um, and particularly with, you know, there's, you know, kids with hyperopia, there are kids with just focusing issues, which is my son's issue. Um, but then with myopia, one of the things that we know is that we need to work very hard to slow down the progression of myopia. Because if we don't, there are some more catastrophic eye diseases associated with that as, as, as children reach adulthood. And some of those are things like retinal detachments, myopic macular degeneration, which is certainly sight-threatening to the central vision, uh, glaucoma, and cataracts. There's a higher probability associated with those who have progressive myopia than the general population. So one of the things that we really want to be very focused on, because we, we know statistically that by 2050, if we don't, half of the world's population will have myopia. So it's really critical to do something now so that we can change some of those future outcomes uh, for more positive. And then you factor in genetics. If um, you or your husband um, also are nearsighted, the chances are, are, are greater that that coupled with the environment are going to trigger not only myopia and probably an early diagnosis of it, but the progression as well. So then if, to, to parents out there who are hearing you and interested in this for the first time, how do we spot myopia? And then what's the intervention? So some of the things that you want to do is look for whether or not your children are squinting. I heard you say that earlier. I did. Uh, if they uh, seem frustrated with their work, if you see them moving around excessively, trying to get things into focus, um, if they start to develop headaches, if their behavior becomes disruptive, sometimes it's a vision issue, it's not a behavioral issue. So those are the types of things that you as a parent wanna look out for, and then you wanna contact your eye doctor 
um, as, as soon as possible and just get that baseline examination done. Okay, it's funny, you know, I remember I, I, I got glasses, I think when I was in fifth grade and they were really cool for a week. And then I realized, oh, you know, this, I don't like these anymore. But I think these days glasses are a lot cooler than they were back when I was in sixth grade. And, you know, I'll be honest, sometimes I, I peek over his shoulder, it's like, I want to see his little classmates. And there are many children wearing glasses. So I, I think at the very least, the awareness of the issue is much greater. I don't know if the problem itself is greater, or if today's parents are maybe just better about really watching and responding to their children's needs than they were back in my time. Um, but glasses aren't, you know, kind of the, the, the mark of a nerd, as, as I felt like they were back in my time. And of course, your glasses- Mine too. Gonna yes, be mine too. So, oh, so you, you had the same experience. I had the exact that. same experience, oh, but it's not like that with children now. Um, yeah. Glasses are a fashion statement, they're cool, and it's, you know, we've really been able to change that whole paradigm around wearing glasses. So, yeah. yeah. Contact lenses, that's been great. Yeah, no, I, I love it. It's like, you know, especially when you see, you know, Hollywood stars and, you know, some of the most gorgeous people in my newsroom have, you know, a pair of glasses for every outfit, as, as it seems you might. So I think, oh, like, <laughs> he's doing it right. So, Dr. Knight, finally, if, if someone is just really hearing about this for the first time, is there any online resource that you'd like to point our viewers to if they'd like to learn more? Yeah, I'd really love to point them to hashtag Game Over Myopia. And that's where you'll have access to some of our material through our, our gaming resources, as well as some of the statistical information that we've collected from parents like you. Um, and I think it will help uh, get very well acquainted with the condition and then use your doctors as a resource. Um, they certainly have a lot of information on this and can get you in for a regular eye examination. That's the biggest part of the thing is just being proactive. Um, not being fearful that there's going to be issues with the offices because I, I you know, feel very confident that every office out there now is following the CDC guidelines and it's a safe and comfortable experience for you. Well, it definitely was for me. Thank you so much, Dr. Millicent Knight, Senior VP of Customer Development at SLR. It's been a joy talking with you. It has been a joy talking with you. Thank you so much. Thank you.